Hi, good afternoon. Um, I've actually been sitting here very worried about what kind of connection I could make back to Italy. I didn't realize this was going to be such a central theme. Um, unfortunately, I'm completely empty-handed. I was tracing back genealogy. I have nothing there. Important friendships, life moments, nothing. So um, I'm, I'm a break in the theme, unfortunately. Um, so I'm here as a historian, as Pietro uh, has introduced me. Um, I want to say also a special thank you to Zoltan for inviting me uh, to present here, uh, especially um, uh, having a chance to talk about this. I'm beginning, as I, I feel one must, with a, uh, a very beautiful and very interesting image of, uh, from Deiter's studies of, uh, of nerves and the neuron. Uh, this is one of the earliest studies from 1865 of dendrites. Uh, but I'm not talking about Deiter. I'm talking about John Hewlings Jackson, often named as the father of uh, British neurology. Now, histology was a very important ingredient in the understanding of the brain uh, throughout the continent and also in England. It wasn't the kind of evidence that Hewlings Jackson used to propel his understanding of the brain. Um, Hewlings Jackson was not a person that made great use of histological studies. He was not a person who made great use of physiological details. He had another body of evidence, um, language. Uh, as you see, one of Hewlings Jackson's first uh, roles within the scientific community, he was a writer of medical vignettes uh, for the Medical Times and Gazette. So Hewlings Jackson, as we see here, Hewlings Jackson is a very prominent figure, but the type of evidence that he uses to give his theory of how the nervous system evolved is linguistic. Uh, he is working with epileptics, he is working with people committed to asylums, and so it's out of his uh, meetings with these patients that he feels he finds the true evidence of how the nervous system has evolved. Now, what I mean by that is by saying that Hewlings Jackson viewed his role as witnessing nature's own experiments. These were pathologies. So for Hewlings Jackson, an understanding of the nervous system could certainly be enlarged by histology or by other things, but there was also a lot to learn just by seeing what goes wrong uh, when there is a lesion in the brain or when there is a mental pathology and how do those instances relate back to our understanding. So I'm missing a lot of pictures of nerves. I hope you don't mind some text. Uh, yes. Oh, only on the microphone. Sorry. Okay. I'm rooted here. I might move this so I can have a little station to kind of work from. So. <laughs> Uh, Hewlings Jackson is here, as you can see, standard Victorian beard. He's not minding under the ear, that's all right. Um, if you're not familiar with him, I have some quick bullet points. He's an assistant to Brown Sicard in 1862. Uh, he's very interested in the work of Herbert Spencer and Broca. He's beginning to tackle those in his writings in 1864. He gives a number of extremely prominent lectures. He gives the Golstonian Lecture in 1869. Um, anyone here who uh, knows the journal Brain, as I'm sure many do, this is founded uh, with Ferrier and Crichton Brown in 1878. Uh, Hewlings Jackson is an integral figure within uh, within British science. Now, that is his reputation, but um, the current readership of Jackson uh, was varied, and sometimes we underappreciate, uh, we, we don't fully appreciate uh, how Jackson was being read and what people were taking away from his work. Now, as I was saying, the principal idea behind Jackson was that he wanted to use an evolutionary framework to explain what mental illnesses were and what was happening to the brain during, uh, during the onset of a pathology. But he was working within a much wider philosophical framework and occasionally people missed the point, like this, this reviewer for the Glasgow Herald uh, who tells us that Dr. Jackson thinks evolution supplies us with a scientific measure which determines, according to intellectual and emotional differences between children and adults, uh, and importantly, and between the different races of men. Considering the most civilized races have the latest acquired faculties, he looks to them for an answer to this question. What are the latest acquired faculties? Now, when I first read this, uh, this is from 1889, I thought, that's so unfair. Here, a journalist, a science journalist for the Glasgow Herald has misunderstood Jackson's mission. He is not interested in this comparison of uh, 
mental faculties between races. Jackson is working on the, uh, providing an evolutionary framework for mental illnesses. But then I thought, well, Jackson is using language. Um, language is the most important um, element in his, his approach. So what is Jackson's view on language? Um, certainly the relationship between the evolution of language and the evolution of the nervous system is one of the hottest topics of the 1870s and 1880s. Um, I have some quotes for you here. So there were lots of different views that Jackson might have held. Um, this is the important philologist A.H. Uh, Sace, he, a friend of Muller, established here in Oxford. Sace is a wonderful representative of people that thought there is no uh, important relationship between uh, the evolution of the brain and the evolution of language. So he tells us very prominently, science implies language. Race or uh, the neurological underpinnings of race do not. That's a line that was you know, very popular and many people backed it. Um, at the same time, you have an idea here in The Descent of Man that uh, tells us that the relation between the continued use of language and the development of the brain has no doubt been far more important than the relationship of uh, strengthening of voice muscles and uh, uh, linguistic uh, underpinnings of, of language within the nervous system. So, here in 1871 in Darwin, you're seeing something different from Sace's position. Darwin is advocating an idea that there is an important link between the evolution of language, spoken word, and the evolution of the, uh, the neurological correlates of speech. These are important. We can learn something from looking at this. Um, look at George Romanes, the, uh, the literary executor of Darwin, as late as 1891. Now, Romanes is advocating that um, the warp and woof, he's, he's, you know, it's 1891, he's very poetic, has some poems, they don't, aren't very good. So the warp and woof of the thousand dialects of every pattern which are now spread over the globe ought to be proof of mental evolution across races. So Jackson is using language as the, the center of evidence for his discussion of the, of uh, mental pathologies, he's very invested in an understanding of what the relationship between language and the evolution of the nervous system is. But as he's developing this framework, there's an enormous debate about what it means in terms of mental evolution across humanity. Simply put, are civilized races more neurologically advanced in their hardwire than a primitive peoples? This is a question that lots of people have different varying opinions on. But Jackson, like Darwin and like other figures, Jackson is not particularly interested in publishing on political, cultural questions. Jackson maintains quite a, quite a discreet focus upon uh, medical questions. So we don't have a direct answer to this question within Jackson's work, which makes it in some ways more interesting to look at. Um, so I've been saying a lot about nerve genesis, relationship between language and nerve genesis. What does this mean? Um, my phone is keeping track of me in time. Yes, good. OK, that's a nice time. So <laughs> let me very quickly go through how nerve genesis, uh, how Jackson views the nervous system evolving, what relationship this could have to Jackson, what kind of view we're expecting Jackson to have at the end of the day. So, the first idea that you need to have is that habitual behaviors on the part of the organism involve replicating patterns of communication in the nervous system. That's pretty simple, yeah? You do the same thing over and over and over. It's the job of the nervous system to retrace the, the neurological correlate of that activity. Fine, good. Um, but the principle of use inheritance is what gives it its hereditary kick, right? That's what makes the difference between what you as an organism are doing and what progeny, what your offspring are going to be doing. So strengthened nervous connections can be transmitted to offspring, right? That's the idea of use inheritance. We, we haven't ruled out um, what are called Lamarckian forms of inheritance now. And Hewlings Jackson uses the idea of use inheritance as the, the founding principle of how he thinks the mind has evolved. Um, so we get this idea that over time, um, repeated actions are strengthening connections in the nervous system and it's being handed down. Now, people that advocated this theory of the evolution of the nervous system had a problem because lots of critics said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I pick up a habit or I learn a poem and that establishes nervous connections. 
my infant child is not going to be born with that poem memorized in its head. What are you talking about? So they had to scale it back, and to avoid that criticism, Hewlings Jackson was saying, okay, I'm not talking about the actual nervous connections being uh, repeated outside of instinct, but for most things, if I'm talking, I'm talking about handing down anatomical possibilities. That's a very tricky term in Jackson's philosophy, but we're going to investigate in a bit later. That's the basic structure of how Jackson thinks that uh, the nervous system evolves. But there are two points that could follow from it and that Jackson could uphold. So the fourth uh, is thinking, insofar as it employs language, is an activity that fulfills number one. So therefore, intellectual activity must, fulfill, must affect the anatomical possibilities of future generations, right? Uh, a civilization that has been reading and doing mathematics for thousands of years is going to have more highly advanced anatomical possibilities than a race that simply has not been doing these things. And fifth, um, a far more controversial premise, uh, human languages are evidence of racial variation in mental evolution, right? So this is a idea which had some uh, grip in the late 19th century that when we uh, do comparative philology, when we compare languages, we will find evidence that uh, the, not only are the languages inferior to the languages of civilized countries, but that shows us underlying neurological inferiority. So my question is, we already know Jackson is on board with the content of one to three. Does he endorse four? Does he even go so far at any stage to, to endorse five? So that's, that's my question for Jackson. Um, yeah, we don't really have time for those. We'll skip on. So, to give Jackson his credit, um, Jackson very on gives us a very strong indication that um, he does not think that five is on the platter. He tells us here uh, in 1868, I take the following propositions to be granted. I'm not aware that anyone denies them, and indeed some people did, but that's okay. Um, we are not born able to speak at all, but we are born with anatomical possibilities, which can be trained in acquirement of any language. Okay. So that tells us something about how Hewlings Jackson views anatomical possibilities, right? All of humanity is on a level. Everybody can speak English. Everybody can learn English. But there's a trick to anatomical possibilities that comes out in his later work. So Jackson, of course, wanted to debate the question of hereditary mental illness. Um, can you be born with a mind that is well, is insane, can you be born with a mind that is already ill? <clears throat> and Jackson tells us, well, no. I'm on the side that says you cannot be born uh, with a tendency to insanity in the sense that you inherit a tendency disease of any part of the brain. But Jackson thinks that what is going on in terms of hereditary mental illness is that you're inheriting a brain that is smaller in the anatomical uh, anatomical uh, possibility sense that it has fewer functional elements in the highest ranges of the highest cerebral centers. You might get a brain which will give out more easily under unfavorable influences than the brain of the average man. So Jackson is coming out and telling us, no, all of humanity is on a level in terms of its anatomic po anatomical possibilities in relation to language. But Anatomical possibilities are playing different roles in Jackson's framework. So you see, through uh, use and disuse, uh, if you have a line of alcoholics or if you have a line of epileptics, Jackson does anticipate that there will be a, a, a transmission, an inheritance of a smaller threshold of anatomical possibility. So, Anatomical possibilities kind of grow and contract dependent on what previous generations are doing. What do I have? Okay, I have about one minute. Um, I want to use that minute carefully. I'm going to skip over some of Jackson's earlier views, um, and I want, to, I want to zoom in on a piece uh, just because I think this piece showcases just how different our historical view of a figure like Jackson can be uh, from how he is known at the time. Um, in 1887, Jackson publishes a paper that he dearly loves on the psychology of joking. 
Now, in the historiography on Jackson, there's little or no mention of this piece, probably because it contains joking in its title. But this is one of Jackson's most successful papers. It's repeated in loads of British newspapers. It's repeated in periodicals. It's very popular. And if you knew of Jackson in the late 1880s, you will know him poss quite possibly due to his views on the evolution of humor. And I think his views on the evolution of humor really shed a light on how Jackson views the relationship of these uh, growing anatomical possibilities um, in terms of mental use. So he tells us persons who are deficient in appreciation of jocosities in their degrees of evolution are in corresponding degrees deficiently realistic in their scientific conceptions. So there's definitely a sense there that Jackson views a level, a hierarchy of, uh, of these anatomical possibilities that extends above command of language where a, a certain repeated uh, intellectual internal play is having neurological effects, right? So the contrast would be for, uh, for Reverend A. H. Sace, where humor is obviously a cultural art, right? It doesn't have a uh, expected neurological underpinning for a race. If one race is very humorous and one race is just completely dead, um, Sace isn't expecting anything neurologically definite in those differences. Jackson, however, does view uh, the presence or absence of humor as indicative of the presence or absence of a, a greater sophistication in the upper hierarchies of, of the nervous system. Um, he tells us, because obviously the question there is, well, we might be speaking on a person-to-person -person basis. Does Jackson actually mean for us to interpret that this can speak for a race? Now again, I want to issue a caveat. I don't think Jackson was particularly concerned with that question. It wasn't one that he placed great evidence in. I don't, I don't want to tar him. But um, he does tell us within this very popular paper, practical jokes belong to the childhood of nations and the boyhood of man. That's a very common uh, uh, comparison between the idea of the mental evolution in a human child and the mental evolution of a race. So, while Jackson certainly is not going to endorse five on my list, um, the Glasgow Herald reviewer does have some point that Jackson's work is fitting into a framework about debates between the relationship of language and uh, between language and mental evolution, where most importantly, Jackson's readers are quite willing to look at Jackson's work, not within a narrow sense of how it, uh, how it is playing out for debates over the nature of epilepsy, but also what, how does Jackson's research uh, impact our understanding of mental differences between individuals, between classes, or between races. Um, I'll close there, thanks very much. <laughs>